Now, back on February the 9th, I mentioned to you that I was intimidated by this book, and nothing has changed since then. Uh, and in fact, I have to say that when I, as I stand here on the cusp of having to preach uh, chapter 6 to 11, uh, my fear and my trepidation in the book of Romans has only increased. And uh, so if you can pray a little bit extra for me as we get into those controversial chapters, I would appreciate it. That being said, let's commit our time in these first five chapters to the Lord this morning. Heavenly Father, uh, once again, we thank you for the work that you have done in our church over the last four years, and we praise you for where you have brought us, praise you for uh, the group of people that you have brought together from all over the place, uh, from different backgrounds, different towns, uh, different ages, and Lord, we just thank you for the way in which you've directed and guided uh, your church as we have progressed from a small little fireside room into this building. And we ask, Lord, that you would direct us continually, that you would help us to maintain our focus on that which is truly important, on the preaching of the word, on discipleship, on the gospel. May we never stray from that, not today, not next week, and for however long this church exists, may it always be founded on the important things that were of first importance to Paul and to Jesus. Lord, as we uh, refresh our memories in the book of Romans this week, uh, I pray, Lord, once again, that this wouldn't just be uh, an act of remembering intellectually, but Lord, that you would use our time of summary to sanctify us, to mold us, to shape us into the image of Jesus Christ, to prepare us for what you are going to teach us over the next number of months in chapter 6, 7, and 8. We dedicate this time to you, ask that you be glorified by it. Amen. So I'm going to take us right back to where we were on February 9th, and I'm going to uh, help us, hopefully, to have our memories refreshed and, and have ourselves renewed in our passion for this book, as well as to hopefully hear the Holy Spirit speaking through His Word. And so if some of this stuff is familiar to you, then good for you for remembering sermons from six, seven months ago. Uh, what I did was I went back and read and listened to the sermons that I preached back then and tried to summarize it. So if it sounds like something I've said before, it probably is. And once again, you get a gold star for remembering that I've said it before. The book of Romans is sort of the book. It's kind of the book in the New Testament that people sort of center themselves on. And it is especially considered to be the book for Reformed Christians. And as you read it, uh, it's easy enough to kind of get the lay of the land, to hear what Paul is saying, uh, to understand his message, to follow his line of thinking as he moves through the various chapters. Uh, but once you begin to sort of get deeper into the book, read it again and again and again, you realize that the themes and theology of this book are exceedingly deep. Uh, they plumb the depths of God's salvation as offered to us in Jesus Christ. And so on one hand, the message of Romans is so easy to pick up that it can be sort of dumbed down into a pamphlet. An evangelistic pamphlet. I don't know if you remember the Romans Road. And yet once you start to reflect on the Romans Road and what that actually means, you realize that this is a rich and diverse book. And so we're going to preach through it one time and it seems like it's going to take us forever. But I'm sure that by the time we get to the end of it, we'll probably want to hit it again at some point in the future. And it was my stated goal back in February, uh, and it continues to be my goal, to preach the book as it stands, to offer insights and implications from its pages only as are warranted by the text, and then to allow the Holy Spirit to take what is written on these pages, to drive it deep into our hearts, and to make us more and more like Him. So let me just briefly remind you about some of the things I mentioned back then, on why it is we need to take time to study the book of Romans. Why are we taking 
you know, two plus years, almost three years to get through this book? Well, let me just highlight four, three or four. Uh, number one, it concerns the gospel that's at the heart of our salvation. If we think that we're living in a day and age where there's great clarity about the gospel, we deceive ourselves. If we think we live in a day and age in which churches affirm the gospel, base their ministry on the gospel, and sing, preach, and live out the gospel, we are even more delusional. Uh, the, the bottom line is, most evangelicals and a lot of churches are not very clear about the gospel. They don't understand what the gospel actually means, and therefore, many Christians struggle in their Christian life. If you can't understand the gospel, if you don't understand what Paul says is of first importance, and what Paul says in Corinthians is the only thing that he teaches, then how is it that you as a church or you as an individual can actually grow to what God wants you to be? And so Romans articulates the gospel, its implications, and where it is that we should follow it, exceedingly clearly for us. Uh, the second reason why we need to get into Romans is that it helps us to understand God's overarching plan of salvation. And, and in doing so, we begin to understand the connection between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Uh, Romans contains 60 plus direct citations to the Old Testament in just 16 chapters. Uh, it's the most Old Testament content, direct quotation of any New Testament book. And Calvin in his commentary, I think, is correct when he said, listen, if you understand this epistle, if you understand Romans, you understand what God has been doing since the Garden of Eden. You understand what he's been doing from the very beginning until the very end. But here's the thing, third thing. Uh, Romans isn't just about theology. We have to re keep reminding ourselves about that. Luther wrote that Romans is the chief part of the New Testament and the purest gospel, which not only deserves to be known by heart by a Christian word for word, but be studied daily as the daily bread of the soul. Luther believed in his commentary that Romans is not only a book that you look at to find and ground yourself in true biblical theology, but it's also one of those books that cannot be studied too much because it is of such value to us in our practical life. And it's not just about the later chapters of Romans. When he gets into chapters 12 and beyond where, where the quote-unquote practical stuff is found. No, in order to live a healthy life, we need to know the gospel. We need to know the deep things of God. We need to know His plan of salvation. You see, if we're not sure about our standing with God, if we don't understand justification, we will be plagued by doubt. How do I know I'm a believer? How do I know that I'm saved? What's God going to do with me once I've sinned? I'm a horrible person. How do I stand before God? Does God hate me? Is He judging me? Is He waiting to hit me with a hammer every time I step out of line? If we fail to grasp the depths of our sin and guilt before God, we'll do the exact opposite. We'll live self-righteous lives. We'll think that coming to church and doing good things and giving our money and being good moral people and helping old ladies across the street and donating our time, money and energy to various charities is actually going to get us right standing with God. That we can do whatever we need to do so that God will just check off all the boxes and then when we die he'll say, hey guess what, the good outweighs the bad and you're in. That's not how it works. And if we're spiritually self-confident like that, what's going to happen to us is we're not going to renounce our own righteousness. Which scripture tells us elsewhere, filthy rags. The best you can do before God is literally the grossest thing that you can think of in human, in, in human experience. And if you don't renounce your filthy rags, you're going to deceive yourself in thinking that God will accept you based on anything that you do. Spiritual deception is, I think, one of the key problems of a lot of Christians. We deceive ourselves into thinking that we don't have a standing with God that He has declared is true for us, or we deceive ourselves into thinking that we have a better standing with God than what we think we do based upon the stuff that we do. And so what Romans does is it centers 
us on the gospel of Jesus Christ and it directs us to living from that. The gospel isn't the door that gets us in. It's the road that we walk. We walk the road of the gospel from the cross until the throne of grace that waits for us upon our death. And then I think the last thing we need to understand is, is it emboldens us to worship. Uh, if, if the book of Romans does nothing but increase our intellect, although that itself is an act of worship, uh, we've missed the point, right? There are points in this book, especially at the end of chapter 11, where Paul, upon reflection of God's greatness, and upon a little bit of confusion in Paul's mind, and just realizing, hey, you've got questions, I don't have answers, so guess what? Why don't we just worship God? Why don't we just recognize we're the creature, he's the creator. He's sovereign, we are finite. He is so much greater than us, so much more merciful, so much more perfect. Why don't we just fall on our knees and worship God instead of asking these idiotic questions that's just going to get us chasing our tail. And that's what Romans does. It brings us to the very point where we end and God begins. And that in and of itself should drive us to our knees in worship. So, what is the book of Romans about? Let's remind ourselves a little bit about who the book of Romans is written to, because who it's written to is important for us to understand, at least at a very basic level, uh, before we get into the real deep things of this passage. So we know that the Romans were a diverse group of Jews and Gentiles, and we know that there was a problem as these two groups got together. We know throughout most of the New Testament, that this Jew-Gentile relationship was a, was a bit of a head-butting issue for a lot of congregations. There are tensions that existed between these, uh, these two groups. And I'll spare you the details, but uh, the, the reality is, uh, the Gentiles and the Jews were wondering, what do we have to do in order to be saved by God? The Jews, some of them, were wondering... Do these Gentiles have to become Jews at some level in order to be accepted by God? And the Gentiles were saying, well, no, we believed in Jesus Christ, the gospel, we don't have to do anything. And so the tensions started to arise. And so Paul responds in Romans as well as in other places by dealing with their struggles in very broad strokes, but very detailed theology. He deals with the issues of legalism and antinomianism in the book of Romans. Legalism deals with this question of, do I have to do right things in order to God, for God to accept me? That was sort of the Jewish perspective. You've got to become a Jew. You've got to obey the law. You've got to become circumcised, etc., etc. And then God will put you in right standing with him. And Paul says, no, that, that's not how it works. But we can't flip onto the other side because the Gentiles seem to deal with antinomianism, totally against any idea of obeying the law. Because their mentality seemed to be, hey, I'm saved by the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, so I think I can just kind of do whatever I want. Or if we put it in a question form, do I have to obey the law to be justified? And the Gentile says, does God expect anything of me now that I've believed in him? And so Paul's trying to answer those two questions as he's helping this group of people to find the gospel, to center themselves on the gospel. And so given kind of that very broad stroke understanding of the situation, the theme of the book becomes clear. And it's something for all of us to understand. Because I think if we look into our hearts, there's... Uh, we, each one of us struggles with those twin things, right? Some of us struggle a little bit more with one or the other. Some of us are a little bit more legalistic. We want to believe that God's going to accept me based on what I do. And we kind of default to that. And then we kind of judge other people for not doing what we do. And then there are those of us, my struggle, which are more antinomian. You know, for, forget about following rules and obeying the law of God. Christ has forgiven me. He's... he's He's fulfilled the law. I don't need to obey. We have a tendency to judge people who, who are a little bit more inclined to be rules followers. And so there's a legalist and an antinomian in each one of us. And so Romans drives home the point of the gospel to all of us who want to be one of those. 
And what he's trying to do here is he's trying to center us on the gospel. He's trying to center the legalist and the antinomian to abandon the things that are not right about their beliefs and center themselves on the gospel that is true. And so we're going to dive into these five chapters as we continue to set our feet in this great book. So we begin... Uh, our, our sort of trek through this book with the theme verses, verses 16 and 17, verses that Jim read this morning. They are the, the heart of Romans. It's the main point which Paul is going to spend the rest of the book uh, it, unpacking. So if you ever get yourself into Romans, at some point you're confused what Paul is saying. Just go back to verse 16 and 17. That's what he's trying to demonstrate. He's trying to demonstrate that the gospel is the power of God for salvation. And in that gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. And then if we could really sum it up even more down to one sentence, it's the righteous shall live by faith. That is what he's unpacking. And so in verse 16, he tells us that salvation for all people is simply by faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, Paul's language here is highlighting the simple fact that, number one, all people need to be saved, and then number two, the way in which they are saved. So let's again refresh our memory a little bit. Romans is going to unpack this for us, but let's let's sort of take a couple of minutes here to, to ask the question, saved from what? Saved from what? And there are four things that Paul is going to highlight throughout the book of Romans that bind us and damn us that that we need to understand. So this is is what's going to happen in in chapters 1 to 5. Paul is going to deal with the first of these two things in in the first five chapters. And then in chapters 6, 7, and 8, he's going to explain to us how the gospel deals with the third and fourth of the things that sin, the the issues that sin uh, creates for us. So chapters 1 to 5 deal with the guilt and the punishment of sin. So what do we need to be saved from? We need to be saved from sin. Why? Because it's made us guilty before God, and as a result of that, we are deserving of punishment. So guilty doesn't mean, I feel guilty, I feel bad. Guilty means that it's a judicial verdict on my soul. That I am a sinner, I stand before God, and I have no right to claim anything from Him. Which basically means that I have deserved and earned punishment. That's the second thing. God rescues us from guilt, God redeems us from punishment. Since I stand before the lawmaker, God, and I am sinful before Him, He is just, righteous, good and loving to give me the punishment that is due my sin. And so chapters 1 to 5 are going to be Paul saying, listen, here's how Jesus Christ rescues you from guilt and from punishment. So it's the power of God unto unto salvation to everyone who believes, first from the guilt, second from from the punishment, from the condemnation. But there's two other things that we need to be saved from. One is pollution, the pollution or corruption of sin, and the other one is slavery. These are going to be the topics of chapters 6, 7, and 8. So what Paul is going to say, listen, Jesus Christ frees you from guilt and condemnation, but he also frees you to live a life that is free from sin. The pollution of sin, sin corrupts everything in us. It dominates us. So that we long for things that are self-destructive, displeasing to God. God redeems us from that. He redeems us from pollution. He redeems us from slavery. Sin, Sin binds us, enslaves us, locks us up. And then it makes us like our slavery. But what the gospel does is it frees us from that. It helps us to see sin for what it actually is. And helps us to see Jesus Christ for who he is and long for him. And that's chapter 6, 7, and 8. As Paul is going to explain, now that you understand the gospel, let me explain how this works as you live a life 
of discipleship. So if we really wanted to put it in fancy theological terms, we would say it this way. Chapters 1 to 5 is Paul explaining why you need justification. Why you need to be justified, put in right standing with God. And then chapters 6, 7, and 8 are going to explain to you why you need to be sanctified. And why that order is so important. Justification, right standing with God comes first. And then 6, 7, and 8 explain to us, this is how you live out the victory that Christ has won for you. And so chapter 6, verse 1 is going to start, hey, should we sin so that grace may increase? If I'm in right standing with God, does that mean I can just give her? My right standing is never going to change, so now I can live however I want. Paul says, stop being an idiot. I'm, I'm paraphrasing the Greek. He says, absolutely not. Have you not been paying attention to anything I've been saying? Let me explain to you how your justification leads you into a proper understanding of sanctification. And so, what we need to understand about the first five chapters of Romans, as we anticipate the next three, is that our salvation isn't just a rescue from something, it's actually rescuing us to something. It puts us into a new place. So, I think that right away changes the way we understand the gospel. Most people think that the gospel is just, it's fire insurance. I believe in the gospel to escape hell. But then I'm on my own. Or, or the gospel is just, just gets me in the door, but now I've just got this big room in which I have to figure things out on my own. No, that's not what Paul is saying. What Paul is saying is, listen, when God has grants you forgiveness, when you come to him through Jesus Christ and accept the gospel, he forgives you, he puts you in right standing, and then what does he do? He adopts you as his children. He says, now you were an alien, you were a rebel, you were in darkness, but now you are my son, you are my child. And as a result of that, I am going to give you a down payment of your inheritance. What I'm going to do is I'm going to say, listen, you have an eternity that awaits for you upon my second coming. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull a little bit of, of that out of the future, and I'm going to dump it in you right now, so that you can live like you are perfect right now. And, that Holy, and the Holy Spirit is that inheritance. And that's a, a key theme of chapter 6, 7, and 8. Chapter 6, 7, and 8 says, listen, you've got the down payment of your salvation in you, and now you've got to live it out. So what we, what we understand from Paul in the first five chapters is what we've been rescued from, but that is only the foundation upon which we stand in order to live to something or live for something. So God has saved us in a way in which he causes his justice to be done full service. We got to deal with God's justice. We got to deal with the law. We got to deal with the wrath. And that's what Jesus Christ has done. He has saved us by grace in such a way that his perfect righteousness has been met. His wrath has been poured out upon his son rather than us. And so chapters 1 to 5 demonstrate for us that, that Christ or that God has not just swept our sins under the rug. He hasn't just said, well, you know what? Yeah, okay, whatever. Well, let's just pretend that didn't happen. No, he's actually dealt with them. And as a result of that, he hasn't just put us neutral in relationship to the law. He's actually given us the righteousness of his son. That's verse 17 where he says, you got to have righteousness. Because you are unrighteous. You can't just be neutral. You have to be righteous before God. And so the alien righteousness of God is draped over us. It's Christ's righteousness, so that when God sees us, He doesn't see our sinfulness, He sees the righteousness of Christ draped over us, which we have accepted by faith. We're acquitted from the guilt of sin on account of the guilt being paid for by Christ, and we are declared to be righteous before God based upon the work of Christ. Paul recognizes one very simple thing. The cross actually deals with sin. 
everything that you think of that sin could cause a problem for you, every, every issue that sin could create a problem for us, God has dealt with it in Jesus Christ. It set things right for us in the courtroom of heaven. It deals with my guilt, my corruption, my slavery, the punishment of my sin, which I deserve. It actually accomplishes my salvation. The way that God has righteously saved me by His grace has caused my sin and all of its consequences to fall instead on Jesus Christ so that justice is served and I can be truly saved. That's the gospel. Christ has taken everything that I deserved upon Himself and has now freed me to be who God wants me to be. Since God's justice is served on the cross, my sin is paid for by Christ, and I am saved and absolutely assured of my salvation. Think about it this way. If God has put the penalty for my sin on the head of His Son, God cannot require any more from me. That is amazing. Since Christ has paid for it all, there's nothing left for me to pay. The only thing that I am left with is the adoption of, uh, 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 of myself as a son or a daughter of Jesus Christ. And I can live in that victory. And all I must do to receive this penalty, Paul says, is have faith. Just faith. Repent of my sin, turn to Christ, that's it. Sounds simple. But we know that it isn't. Because we know that verse 18 follows verse 17. These are the chapters that we don't really like in the book of Romans. Verse 18 of chapter 1 to 3 verse 20. Because basically Paul just tells us how horrible the human race is. How horrible each one of us are apart from Christ. Uh, chapters 1 to 3 are not very pleasant to read because the message they deliver is not one that we typically want to hear. What Paul is doing is he's offering an extended analysis of who humans really are. And as we read through these verses, we're confronted with the fact that our human nature is not in a very good state at all. In fact, I don't think there's Words we could use in, this, in the English language which can, which can truly demonstrate how horrible a state the human person is. Uh, the, the closest that I could come it would be to go back to Jeremiah and remind us that we are sinful and wicked above all things apart from Christ. And so what Paul does in these chapters is he gives us a kind of history here, a kind of redemptive history or pre-redemptive history, something which is true for all people. And he's, he's giving us a kind of uh, overview of our human nature so that we can really understand the plight that our sinfulness has placed us in. And I think one of the reasons why he takes so long to do it is because as humans, I think we have this natural inclination to think of ourselves as actually better than others. Right? Or, or at least better than someone else. So we may read this kind of stuff and say, well, I may be a bad person, but they are even worse. And so I think Paul takes all this time so that by the time we get to the end of chapter 3, we are beat down with the fact that every single one of us are in the same spot. And so let's look at these circumstances that humanity are in and their implications because they make the case for why we need the power of God unto salvation. Why do we need the gospel? Well, because we're, we're in trouble in our sinfulness. So verses 18 to 32, the end of chapter 1, highlight the fact that the wrath of God is poured out on sinners. Paul is very clear that God pours out His wrath upon all ungodliness and all unrighteousness. God's wrath has been deliberately and consistently and willfully provoked because we have rejected God. God's revealed himself in the world around us. And we should, on account of that, be pursuing him, worshipping him. 
But we don't do that. We turn each our own way. And we do things that, are, that arise wrath within God. God's wrath is not capricious, is what Paul is saying. God just doesn't pour out his wrath just because he, he's feeling grumpy that day. No, God's wrath has been deliberately and consistently provoked because human beings willfully reject God. He's clearly seen in nature. He's clearly seen in our consciousness. We suppress the truth, verses 18 and 20. We choose to worship false gods in place of the true God. That's verses 21 to 23. And though we know the right things to do, we choose to deny those right things and do instead what is unrighteous. And even worse, we encourage other people to follow us in our unrighteousness. That's verses 24 and 26. So what does God do? He judges us. And how does he judge us? Well, he judges us by giving us up to the very sins in which we engage. Now you know why our world is so terrible. Because God says, you want to sin? Here you go. Have more sin. Is that what you really want here? Have more of that. You want to be corrupt? Be more corrupt. You want to follow this sexual deviation? Follow that sexual deviation. You want to you know, be greedy and you want to lust and you want to connive and backstab? Go, go ahead. Knock yourself out. The punishment for sin from God is more sin. And it creates this downward spiral of the world around us. Which is why I think as Christians... We should never be shocked at how bad our world is. Because sin is so horrible. We should look around and go, what do you expect? What do you expect our government to do? What do you expect these people to do? Of course, this is what's going to happen when God gives them over to their sin. And so the process that Paul outlines is clear. First, what we do is we abandon and rebel against God whom we should worship. And then God judges us by abandoning us to the depths of our sinfulness. We turn away from glorifying God. And what that does is it unleashes a host of sinful vices. And brings the judgment of God in the form of more sin. And as sinners we just eat that stuff up. And we just create this quite literal highway to hell. Chapter 2 until verse Eight of chapter 3, Paul is going to demonstrate for us more consistent, uh, more, uh, in more depth, that God's judgment is just, righteous, and perfect, even as it falls upon religious people. Now again, we could get ourselves to the end of verse 32 and think, okay, well that's, that's true for them out there. That's true for pagans, that's true for non-Christians, that's true for people outside the church. But I am inside the church. I'm a good person. I live a moral life. I went to Sunday school. I know all the worship songs. But Paul says, guess what? There is judgment for you as well. In these verses, Paul turns his attention to a person who thinks... That they are better than what they actually are. Uh, to people who are pleased that we're not like them out there. And so in verse 1 of chapter 2, Paul abruptly shatters this notion by declaring that the people who think themselves to be religious actually do the very same things that the pagans do. The non-Christians do. And suddenly, Paul turns on those very same people and accuses them of doing the very same things. Now again, if we want to read the vices at the end of chapter 1, I think we would all realize that we do all of those things. There's not a, simple, a single person, I think, that can read verses 28 to 32 and uh, find themselves outside the purview of God's judgment. But just in case there's someone who thinks that they are better than that, Paul turns on these self-appointed judges and says, listen, you are no better than they are. Paul wants to make it patently clear that no effort by either an irreligious person or a religious person can save them. Religious, good works, following the law for the Jew does not save anyone. And then when you get to verses 9 to 20 of chapter 3, you get the final verdict. That sort of last shot 
I don't know if you're into MMA. I'm not really. But you know in MMA, right, they got to tap out or the, or the, or the ref's got to come in. You ever see these clips where they're, they're squaring off and the guy drops him with a kick? He's clearly unconscious. But the ref hasn't stepped in. You've got to make sure he's down. So what does he do? He jumps on this clearly unconscious guy and starts pounding away in his head until the ref comes in and tackles him. That's what Paul's doing in verses 9 to 20. If you haven't been knocked unconscious by the depth of your sinfulness yet, let me jump on top of your unconscious corpse and beat the daylights out of you with a bunch of quotations from the Old Testament. You, you, if there's even a shred of thought that you might be a good person, that you might not be sinful, that you might not be deserving of the wrath of God, let me jump on you and punch you over and over and over again with all these quotations from the Old Testament. That's what Paul's doing. He's reminding us of the universal sinfulness of the human race. No one can get to verse 20 of chapter 3 and think in any way that they're actually good That they're actually righteous. That they can actually save themselves by anything they can do. So here's what these uh, chapters mean for us as we sit here today. I don't just want to overview. I want, again, to remind us of what they should mean to, to us. The first one is obvious. We must admit the depth of our sinfulness. As I've said before... And as I will continue to say, because Paul's going to continue to say it, there's always that propensity within each one of us to think of ourselves as not truly sinful. Or that we're not as bad as other people, so that's okay. Right? We compare ourselves to somebody else. Well, I'm not as bad as them, so my bad isn't as bad. Well, guess what? There's no sliding scale before the throne of God. Paul absolutely will not allow us to think that way. His point is absolutely clear as summed up in verses 22 and 23 of chapter 3. He says, There is no distinction. All have sinned. All that means you. means me. And we have all fallen short of the glory of God. There's our problem. That's why the gospel, as Paul is saying in verse 16, is the power of God. Because it pulls us out of the depth of our sinfulness. And it gives us a righteousness that we cannot earn on our own. Which leads us to the second thing that we need to be aware of as we sit here today. Is that we need to admit our inability to save ourselves. You see, once we admit our sinfulness, there's always the danger lurking within us that wants to attempt to absolve our own sin, to relieve our own guilt... By doing things that we think will put us in right standing with God. There's always this desire for us to say, okay, I'm bad, I'm sinful and evil. Okay, Lord, what do I do? What do I do? How can I make this right? How can I make you happy with me? But that's that's just perpetuating the sinfulness. And for people who think this way, Paul reminds us that, that if we think we can save ourselves, what we need to do is go back to verse 18 of chapter 1. Because we haven't understood our sinfulness yet. If you really think you can save yourself, you don't understand how bad you really are. Like Paul says in verse 10, None is righteous. None. No one understands. Verse 11. No one seeks God. That means you. That means me. Which means there's nothing you can do to save yourself. Because... no. As soon as you think you're seeking God, you're not. You're worshiping yourself, chapter 1. So now you're back to square one in the sin problem. See, this is why verse 24 of chapter 3 explains that all sinners are justified by God's grace as a gift. Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. That's the power of the gospel. There's no one righteous, not even you. And what you need is a salvation that comes from outside of you. The power of gospel, redemption that is in Jesus Christ. And so the most stupendous blunder that we could ever make is to think that we can overcome our own sin. 
That we can remove ourselves from God's judgment. That we can work ourselves into salvation by anything and everything that we might think of that we can do. And so Paul reminds us that when the sinner looks anywhere else than to the gospel of Jesus Christ, you're looking in the wrong place. So Paul takes multiple chapters to continue to pound home the simple point that we have no assurance found in ourselves. No Savior found anywhere else than in Jesus Christ. He's telling us, don't look for your safety, for your refuge, for victory over sin, for salvation of any kind outside the power of God in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And remember that the only way to access that is by repentance and faith. Which is his point in verses 21 of chapter 3 until the end of chapter 5. That God's saving righteousness is revealed in Jesus Christ and it is accepted by faith. So the end of chapter 3 verses 21 to 31 highlight to us that our right standing with God is always apart from works. Paul tells us that what God, what God has done in Jesus Christ uh, is provides us with salvation from our sins. Essentially what he's doing here is he's saying, listen, the bad news is really bad. You should feel hopeless. You should feel empty. You should feel completely at the end. But the good news is so good. Luther said that this is the chief point, the center of the epistle. In fact, he says the center of the entire scriptures. There's a righteousness that can overcome the guilt. And that's found in Jesus Christ. He's accomplished what's necessary for sinners to be justified. On the cross, Christ has redeemed us from our sins, paid our debt, set us free. There's no more guilt. And there's no more power of sin. And not only does Christ do that, he turned away the wrath of God from us. He was our propitiation. He took the wrath that we deserved. So he's our righteousness, he's our propitiation, and on account of that, I am given right standing of God and I avoid the wrath. I'm justified by faith in his sacrifice, not by anything that I can do. Anything and everything I can do are pathetic, sinful attempts to earn God's favor, which will never work. As he says in verse 28 of chapter 3, For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from observing the law. Sinners receive a righteousness from God which saves us through faith alone and not through anything that we might attempt in order to save ourselves. To drive that point home, he takes a look in the Old Testament, the life of Abraham. And he demonstrates to us why Abraham's experience has uh, significant importance for me. He, he wants to demonstrate with utmost clarity that works don't save us. And so what he does is he turns his attention to the father of the Jews, Abraham. The one who received the covenant of God's promise in the Old Testament. And for the Jewish person, if anyone in their history had a right to boast before God, it was Abraham. He was given the covenant by God and he was given its seal, which is circumcision. If anyone had the right to boast before God about his working for salvation, is Abraham. But what Paul does is he shows us that Abraham was justified by faith and not by anything that he did. Meaning that not even the great Abraham, the receiver of the covenant, the receiver of circumcision, could ever boast before God about his salvation. The point he's making in chapter 4, if Abraham had nothing to boast about before God, the conclusion then is obvious for us. We're not as good as Abraham. We're not even close to being as important as Abraham is. So we can't boast about our salvation. If Abraham couldn't work for it, neither can I. If works didn't save Abraham, works will not save you and I. And so Paul confirms even further that salvation is received by faith in the work of Jesus Christ. And it's never earned. It's never worked for. Chapter 5, 
Paul turns his attention to another Old Testament character, Adam. But this time the comparison is between Adam and Christ, not Adam and me. And the reason why is that what Paul wants us to do is to understand that there are two key figures in the drama of redemption and you and I are not one of them. There's the first member of the human race, Adam, who is the source of human sin. And then there's Jesus, the second Adam, who is the savior of the human race. The first covenantal person, Adam, he damned us in our sinfulness. The second Adam, the second covenantal head, he undid everything that the first Adam did. And essentially, Paul is dealing with the question, how can Jesus Christ bring about incredible benefit to all of us? How can just this one guy who died on a cross and was raised to life by God himself, how can that guy undo everything that you've just told us about in the first four chapters? You said we're sinful, that we're not righteous, that we're slaves to sin, we're corrupt and polluted. And, and you've just made the point, Paul, that not even Abraham could free himself from that through his works. And now you're telling us that faith in Jesus Christ is all I need? How does that work? Well, he says, here's the thing. The, the, the first man, Adam, he is the biological head of the human race, but he's also, we use the word federal head, covenantal head. Of the human race. God made a covenant with, Ab with Adam to represent all of us. And Adam served in this capacity in his probation period in Eden. And in Genesis 3 we read about how well he did on our behalf. Sin entered God's creation on account of Adam's failure. As, as well as its wages. Death. Death came along for everything and everyone. But we know from Genesis 3 as well as the rest of Scripture that sin and death are not the final word for God's people. Because Paul says in chapter 5 verse 20, where sin abounds, grace abounds even more. As the second Adam, Jesus Christ stands as the head and federal representative of all the redeemed and justified. All those whom the Father had chosen in Christ... And for whom he performs his priestly work in his incarnation and in his mediation before the Father. And so throughout verses 12 to 21 of chapter 5, Jesus is depicted by Paul as the second Adam, whose perfect obedience effectively overturns the sentence of death, which now hangs over the human race. And this is why we have faith in Jesus Christ, because he undid what Adam did. And now offers us everything that we need to be saved. So here's where we are as we anticipate chapter 6. Here's where we are. That kind of arise out of verses 18 to 21. We'll focus our attention a little bit there as we finish this off. Sin is our universal unsolvable problem which brings God's judgment. That's the beginning of verse 18. There's one trespass, that was Adam, and it led to the condemnation of all of us. So it's a universal problem, and it's unsolvable for us, and we deserve all of the judgment that we get from God on account of it. But second thing we need to notice is in verse 20. God has not left us to our sin. He has given us a way to, to, be, to have guilt and punishment, pollution and slavery removed from us. Because where sin increased, grace increased all the more. The whole purpose of God graciously sending His Son as a propitiation for our sins is to utterly defeat sin in all its effects. Paul explains that the dominion of sin and its consequences are ended because Jesus Christ died and rose again. He has conquered sin in every possible way. Which means then, third, that the grace of God in the gospel reigns on account of what Christ has done. That's verse 21. 
If our problem is that we are under the weight of sin, which is mastery over us, think about how cruel it would be for God to say, all right, I'll free you from a little bit of sin. Uh, Let's say I'll free you from the eternal punishment and I'll free you from the guilt, right? But everything else is you. Right? You gotta get over its slavery, you gotta get over its corruption, you gotta deal with its pollution, you gotta struggle with it. How first of all, would we consider that to be a victory by Christ over sin on the cross? That's no victory. And second of all, how cruel would it be for God to say, I've defeated some of sin but not all of it? I hope I'll see you at the other end. Grace reigns through Christ. God saves us by His righteousness. And it's the righteousness of God in Christ that not only puts us right with Him, but puts us in a position where our sins are forgiven and where we are freed. Freed to live a life of godliness. Free to live from the righteousness of Christ. Where we are transformed into a new creation in Jesus Christ. So God doesn't just forgive us and then leave us in bondage. He breaks the power of reigning sin. That's chapter 6. Chapter 6, verses 1 to 11 are some of the most beautiful verses for anyone struggling with sin. God doesn't just give us grace to get us back to neutral. He gives us grace So that we can continue to live out his victory. He gives us grace upon grace so that sin is eliminated not from our experience. So we can be increasingly conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. Yeah, we need to battle and struggle and mortify sin. But we got to get the order right. And that's one of the most beautiful things that we're going to see over the next number of weeks. Verses... 1 to 11 of chapter 6 come before verse 12. If you wonder what I mean, just go and read the verses. Before Paul ever says to you, do something about your sin, what he tells you is that stuff has already been done about your sin. So you don't have to actually do anything more because it's been dealt with by Jesus Christ. So now live from the victory. And so that means lastly... That our sanctification, our living out of the Christian life, is based 100% on the continued mediation of Jesus Christ in our life. Put it differently, we live a gospel-centered life every moment of every day. We never leave the gospel. On the cross, we see the worst that sin could possibly do. We see the judgment of God fall upon the worst that sin could possibly do. But at the cross, we also see that the most that sin can do cannot even come close to thwarting God's purposes. To save a people unto himself through Jesus Christ. At the cross, grace overwhelms sin. And it always will. Every single aspect of our salvation, past, present, and future, is ours in Jesus Christ. We are never freed from the cross. And the reason why is because in the past Jesus Christ through his person and work secured our salvation. That's one of the mind-blowing things that we're going to realize at the beginning of chapter 6 and I've mentioned it a number of times before because Paul's mentioned it. It's like when did you become a believer? When Christ died. That's when. That's when your salvation was won. Yeah, you had faith on whatever date and whatever time and wherever, but you were saved. When Christ died. That's gonna, if that doesn't blow your mind, I don't know what is. But see, that's, that's what Paul stands on. That's why you can't ever free yourself from the gospel. Because Christ has secured everything you need when he died. And when God confirmed his accepted death by raising him from the dead. Which means that in the present, all we need to do to have our soul satisfied. All we need to do to gain victory over temptation. All that we need is found on the cross. It's found in the empty tomb. When we battle with sin, we are brought back to the realities of what Christ has done on the cross. You see, we've got to think about it this way. Whenever we want to sin, 
This is what we're essentially doing. We're climbing up the hill of Golgotha. We're putting our stepladder up against the cross. And we're pulling our sin off of it. And we're saying, I I don't want you to die for this sin because I want to hold on to it. That's what sin is. And that's where the victory is, is to go and stand at the foot of the cross and say, you know what, I will not be tempted by this sin. I will not be be held captive by this sin. You know why? Because it's nailed to the cross right there. It's paid for, it's done, it's over, and I will not pull it down. That's how we live a sanctified life. Our justification is the foundation of our sanctification. We live our future Christian life by always looking back to what Christ has done on the cross. And then we know that someday in the future, there's going to be a beautiful day in which Christ is going to come back. And he's going to destroy death. He's going to destroy sin. He's going to consummate his kingdom. And we will have the rest of eternity, if you can even fathom that, to exist in his perfect presence where sin is no more. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we so desperately await that day. But Lord, until you come, help us to center ourselves on the gospel. Man, it's so easy for us to be distracted by the centrality of your work on the cross. Man, there's so many books and so many sermons and so many podcasts that try and give us steps to this and steps to that and how to defeat this and that 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 take us away from the gospel, that, that try and convince us that the power of sin is something that we can deal with, that if we just change our habits and if we just, you know, put something on our computers, if we just change our schedule, if we just commit a little bit more, then we can defeat sin. Lord, may you help us to recognize how foolish that is. And may you drive us to the realities that you've highlighted in the first five chapters of Romans. That the power of the gospel gives us salvation, frees us from sin. And the only way in which we can embrace that, engage that, live out those things, is a continued life of repentance and faith. Lord, drive each one of us to our knees for, in repentance. And Lord, lift our eyes up to the victory you've won on the cross by faith. May you be glorified by our church. May you glorify, be glorified in each one of our lives as we struggle and battle with sin with the power of the gospel. Amen.